Good. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever uh, you may be. And welcome to the first session um, of DOTS in uh, 2024. I'm very excited to uh, welcome our first speaker for the day, Professor uh, Marlene Balvert from Tilburg University. Marlene works on optimization and data science problems uh, that have direct social impact. And her research aims to answer questions related to bioinformatics and food security, uh, where she is also part of the Zero Hunger Lab, as you can see in her uh, Zoom background. Um, and she uses data and analytics and optimization uh, to help uh, non-governmental organizations achieve uh, the sustainable development goal two of uh, Zero Hunger. Um, and she also works on uh, the development of methodologies for data analysis uh, for the large uh, genome data sets. And the goal of these methods is to identify some genetic characteristics, uh, such as susceptibility to diseases um, and things of that sort. And, and she does that with uh, collaborators in those domains. So today, I believe she'll tell us about uh, one of these methods, uh, which is Ireland. So uh, Marlene, please take it away. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Elias, for the for the lovely introduction. Um, so as Elias already mentioned, uh, I work mostly on uh, a genome data analysis and develop methods to analyze such data. Um, and one of those methods is uh, fairly recent. It got uh, published in Info's Journal of Computing last week or the week before. Um, and it's called Ireland. That stands for Iterative Rule Extension for the Logical Analysis of Data. So in half an hour, you will know all about uh, why this name and what it means. Um, so first of all, uh, this is a method that helps analyze uh, data. So that means that it is basically a machine learning. And to go all the way back to the beginning, I'll give you a quick recap of uh, what a classification problem means. So when we have a classification problem, we have a bunch of data. We have n samples. And for each of these samples, we have some known information, the independent variables, and we note them, we note them by x. Uh, and we have a dependent variable, y, and the dependent variable is what we, what we want to predict. Now, in classification, this dependent variable is a class that could be k classes, um, but often you will see two classes. Um, in the uh, research that I work on, you often have uh, genome data, so the genetic information of a whole bunch of people. Some of them do have the disease that we're studying and some of them do not have the disease that we're studying. So then you have a binary class, a zero or a one. But in fact, this is everything that I'm gonna tell you today can be extended to multiple classes as well. Now, the goal in any classification problem is to find the relationship between this class Y and the independent variable X. Uh, in my case, this, is, this X is genome data. And you can denote that by y equal to f of x. So we're interested in this relationship f. And as an optimization expert, you can then be interested in uh, creating a model that determines the class of a new sample. Now, this modeling uh, that becomes very interesting uh, if you look at this functional relationship y equal to f of x. So what does this function f look like? That is where uh, we have to make a couple of choices. Now, if you're just a user of machine learning, um, then you need to make, first of all, a choice of which specific machine learning model you use, because that specific model imposes a functional form of f. Um, you have, for example, logistic regression, then you assume a linear form. But if you go more advanced, random forest support vector machine, you assume all different kinds of forms. And if you use a deep neural network, you pretty much assume no form at all, because that is super flexible and can learn pretty much anything. Now, once you've chosen your model type, uh, you will optimize your parameters uh, such that the pred prediction error is minimized. Now, that is if you would use uh, classification, uh, machine learning for classification. Um, but I will go one step further. I will go into developing these machine learning models that impose a specific form. And in this talk, uh, I'll look at one specific form that is specifically relevant for uh, genetics data. And that, look, that's too fast. That is a Boolean phrase in disjunctive normal form. Now, a Boolean phrase in disjunctive normal form, or DNF, looks as follows. If 
uh, a sample has characteristics A and B and C, so here we have an AND clause, or they have characteristics X and Y, or they have characteristics, well, a whole bunch of them, then we classify them as a case, and otherwise we classify them as a control. So basically, we're setting a couple of uh, conditions uh, for a sample to be a case. Um, and of course, these AND clauses could be of any size. Uh, this would be a, a hyperparameter in the model. And of course, you can also choose any number of AND clauses that you include in your Boolean phrase in the analysis. Um, also, I think I forgot to say at the beginning of the talk, but if at some point you feel like things are unclear, feel free to ask questions uh, already. Because it's always good to understand before we continue. All right. So what does this look like in genome data? Well, it looks as follows. I already mentioned that I look at data where uh, a, um, some of the people in the data set have the disease that we study and others do not. And of course, we're interested in which genetic characteristics cause the disease or lead to disease. So in the case of genome data, we would say if somebody has genetic variants, G2 and G892, and some other genetic variant, or if they have two uh, genetic variants that we're interested in, etc., then they are susceptible to the disease. And this is actually why I'm using the Boolean phrase in DNF, because this is exactly how, uh, from a biological standpoint, you can look at the cause of genetic diseases. Um, sometimes we know that a single genetic variant causes a disease. This happens in specific forms of cancer. Uh, sometimes we know that a combination of genetic variants uh, variants causes a disease. And we also know that usually there are multiple combinations of genetic variants that each independently of each other could lead to the disease. So this Boolean rule in DNF is very um, close to how we think about it biologically. So that means that if we have a machine learning model that can analyze genome data and then give you results like this, then that's very useful uh, when understanding the disease, first of all, and furthermore, as a next step uh, for um, developing drugs. Now, such models exist. However, they usually cannot handle very large amounts of data. So the goal of today, or basically the goal of Ireland, is uh, to provide an algorithm that is able to identify Boolean phrases in DNF from large data. And by large data, I mean uh, databases with uh, thousands or tens of thousands of individuals and often millions of variants. Uh, we will not reach the millions of variants today, but this is the data that we're looking for. All right. Now, the model that already exists uh, is a mixed integer program. Can I, can I ask a, uh, just a quick question, Marlene? Yes, of course. So um, I know that early on in machine learning, uh, when people were starting to do kind of learning theory and figuring out what is learnable and what is not learnable. This problem of um, learning a disjunctive normal form uh, was the main type of type of model, right? That is kind of non, you know, non-linear, uh, you know, it's not just, just a linear model. Um, and people did theory there. So is, is this essentially the same problem, but being approached more from a computational and also scalability perspective? Yes, it is. So indeed, the, the problem was, um, I think two or three decades ago, shown to be uh, very hard. Um, mm -hmm. But algorithms have been developed indeed to, to look from a computational perspective to see uh, how far we can go in terms of mm -hmm. the amount of data that we can analyze. Yeah, exactly. Okay, nice. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so the most successful method um, of a couple of years ago uh, was an integer mixed integer program, um, and it was used in several papers. And the two papers mentioned here were research uh, were uh, published by uh, the Dutch Cancer Institute. Um, so let's have a look at what this mixed integer program looks like. And here you see again the the standard form of a DNF rule, and how we should think about it is that we have a bunch of AND clauses, which we choose ourselves. Um, and for each of those AND clauses, we need to decide uh, which features, which variants are in that AND clause. 
So we need variables that choose that. Uh, so, and for that, we introduce binary variables S, J, K. S, J, K equals one if feature J is an AND clause K, and we have capital K AND clauses, and zero otherwise. Okay, good. If we now know if the model has chosen which uh, features are in each of the AND clauses, then of course the model also needs to decide for each of the samples whether or not they satisfy each of the AND clauses. So we have another bunch of binary variables, T and K equal to one if sample N satisfies AND clause K zero. Now, if we know T and K, then of course we can also make a final prediction um, because a sample is classified as a case if it satisfies at least one AND clause. And for that, we have variables Y hat N, which is binary again. And of course, you can um, uh, formulate constraints that make sure that the relationships between S, T, and Y hat are correct. There are a couple of formulations that you could use, um, some of them more efficient than others. Um, uh, but I will not go into them here, because that would not fit in time. Now, of course, as an objective, we use uh, minimizing the classification error, as you would pretty much always do. Now, if you look at this, you already see that we have a lot of binary variables, making the problem uh, difficult to solve. Uh, as JK, we have two times the number of features times the number of AND clauses. And we have the multiplication with two, because a feature could either be in the AND clause or not having the feature could be in the AND clause, so the negation. Then we have a uh, number of samples times number of AND clauses variable T and number of samples uh, of variables y hat n. So that's a there's lot a of question. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Imre. Is there any restriction on the number or length of the clauses? Um, you can place a restriction. I always place a restriction. And again, what that value is, is then a parameter that you have to choose yourself. Um, so a hyperparameter to be optimized, basically. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the main reason why, uh, why I would use uh, a cap on the number of uh, variables is uh, that if they grow too large, they become very difficult to understand. And the problems that I work on, the main goal is to understand what comes out. Um, if you would not impose uh, a maximum, the model will not, will most likely not make extremely large uh, AND clauses because the more features you have in an AND clause, the fewer samples satisfy it. So either it will lead to overfitting or it will not be interesting use that much. All right. So the main issue is here in uh, the number of variables S and T, where we multiply by the number of AND clauses. So that causes quite a problem. Uh, for that, uh, what we can do is we can split up the problem. And this was also done before. Uh, and we split it up into a master and a sub problem. So what I'm going to explain now is very close to column generation, and in the case of Sanjeev Dash and his colleagues, it is actually column generation what they used. So there's a subproblem, and in the subproblem, we generate one new AND clause. And if you do that a couple of times, sorry, you end up with a pool of AND clauses. Now then, in a master problem, from that pool of AND clauses, you can select those AND clauses that form the best Boolean phrase. You get some shadow prices, etc and you return to your subproblem. And you keep iterating until you uh, know that you're at an optimal solution or that your solution is sufficiently good. So this is what was done um, already in a few papers before. Now, why this is nice, you can probably see this coming already. The variables S, J, K, and T, and K now have the subscript K. But if we only uh, create one AND clause, then we do not need the subscript K anymore. And the subproblem has way fewer variables uh, than the original problem. All right, so that's very useful. The subproblem that we then can formulate basically says minimize uh, the number of samples that we got wrong. And of course, we have some constraints that the relationship between T and S is correct. All right. Now we made a slight uh, modification to this. And uh, why, I will explain that to you later. But for now, uh, let's just assume that we made this modification. Instead of minimizing the error, what we're going to do is to maximize the number of cases that are actually classified as a case by this AND clause. 
while of course restricting the number of controls, so where the actual class is zero, um, that are wrongly classified. So we, we put an upper bound on the number of controls that are classified as a case. And this is a fraction of the total number of uh, controls that we have. So it changes the problem slightly. Uh, and we get a subroutine that looks as follows. Again, we have our subproblem. And this time, uh, this subproblem has a specific upper bound, UBU. Um, with that subproblem, we generate And in a master problem, we also change this objective. And we select AND clauses that form a Boolean phrase. All right. Now, this subproblem still has quite a large number of variables, which is uh, the number of sample, samples plus the number of features. So it would be nice if you could reduce that. Now, for that, let's look at a small example. Suppose that we have a data set with six cases and six controls. And at some point in our iterative procedure, we have found two AND clauses already, clause one and clause two. Now, if you would make a DNF phrase with these two AND clauses, then you would get, would get this prediction. If we now in a subproblem would try to create a new AND clause, then it might come up with this AND clause over here. Now, if you add this AND clause to the DNF rule, then it does not change anything to your prediction because everybody that was classified as a case already is, uh, sorry, everybody who is classified as a case by clause three was already classified as a case. So this is not helping as much. Instead, we would be much more interested in this clause number three. So basically, um, we're only interested in those cases that have not yet been classified as a case. And in fact, case one, two, three, and six are not relevant at all. All the controls are relevant because still for each of the AND clauses separately, we would like to stay below this upper bound. So that means that it's only useful to include cases four and five. And we will call this subset N1 hat. Now this N1 hat can still be very large. And um, if you generate an AND clause with a subset of your data, um, you will find an AND clause that satisfies also a bunch of cases that are not in your subset. So what we do is we also take a random subset of cases from this N1 hat. And then the subroutine changes. So we have our pool of AND clauses, and we solve our master problem with the upper bound. And from that, we find N1 hat, all the cases not yet classified as a case, and we take a random selection of those samples. With that, we solve the subproblem, which is now way smaller than it was before, get a new AND clause, and we keep on iterating. Now, this subroutine uh, forms the basis of Ireland. And of course, we have some stopping criteria there. Uh, related to the improvement in each iteration or the uh, objective value, if we're sufficiently happy with it. And if the stopping criteria are met, um, we again solve the original master problem where we minimize uh, the total error. And we can keep on doing this until all our stopping criteria are met. So that's the general idea of Ireland. Now, with that, um, we conducted some experiments um, and we have a bunch of data sets for that. First of all, synthetic data, where we have all control. We can vary the number of samples, number of features. We can make data that fits exactly a bunch of DNF rules. We can change the rule complexities. We can change the noise levels, et cetera. Then also there's a genome data set that uh, Ireland was tested on. And uh, it was compared with uh, BRCG, Boolean Rule Column Generation, by Sanjeev Dash, because that is the model that so far works the best. Now, let's have a look at the results. Um, in a moment, you will see a whole bunch of dots, and each dot represents a data set. And on the left, you see the objective value, and on the right, you see the runtime. Now, if you compare uh, the performance for data without any noise, you will see that BRCG always finds the optimal solution, the perfect Boolean rule in DNF, whereas Ireland does not. So that means that for data without any noise, there's no point in using Ireland. Stick to BRCG. Now, if we go to noisy data, we need to make a distinction between the sizes of the data sets. 
if we, for example, have a data set with uh, fewer than a thousand samples and fewer than a thousand features, then these are the results that we get. You see here that again, BRCG finds better objective values than Ireland, and Ireland is even slower than BRCG. So for noisy data that is not too large, again, it's best to use BRCG. Now, if we then look at bigger data sets, for example, data sets with 10,000 samples and 10,000 features, we see a different picture. This is where uh, Ireland starts outperforming BRCG, not in terms of runtime, because in terms of runtime, Ireland takes more time, but in terms of objective value, it can reach very uh, high improvements. And actually, this picture you see for all data sets with uh, more than 1,000 features or more than 1,000 samples. Now, let's also have a look at what happens when uh, we use genome data. What happens then is something that looks kind of funny. Um, BRCG tends to always come up uh, with an accuracy of 25, sorry, an error of 25%, um, whereas Ireland can end up with very different errors. Now, this is because in the genome data set that we had access to, um, we have about 25% cases. And BRCG was not able to find uh, a proper Boolean rule. In fact, it always classified every sample as a control. And this is why we see this uh, strange pattern happening. Now, if we then look a little bit closer at what exactly comes out, here we have one example for one data set. And this data set is one of the synthetic data sets, so we know the underlying truth the true Boolean rule in DNF. And this data set contains five AND clauses, five true AND clauses. And these are AND clauses that were generated by Ireland or BRCG. So they were not in a true rule, but these five were. Now, we see that both Ireland and BRCG find the first three AND clauses, the shorter ones. And these are AND clauses that also have sufficient evidence in the data, sufficient number of true positives and very few false positives. And that's why they were able to find it. Then both Ireland and BRCG found other AND clauses um, that try to uh, classify the remaining cases. Now, this is where the difference comes in. And this is uh, also where the difference in performance comes. Then there's one final aspect uh, that uh, is actually very helpful about Ireland. Um, so what was very specific is that in this subroutine, we run a subroutine for a bunch of these upper bounds on the number of false positives, right? And in any machine learning problem, you always have a trade-off between having more true positives, which also causes more false positives, versus keeping the false positives down, but also having fewer true positives. So basically, the sensitivity specificity trade of curve. Now, with Ireland, what we did is we generated a pool for various upper bounds. So that means that in the end, if we want to do, uh, if we want to use weights on the number of true positives and false positives, then we can vary our balance between sensitivity and specificity. And then it is very easy to generate this Pareto curve um, using that bunch of uh, uh, of AND clauses that each have a different trade off. So, to conclude, Ireland has led to a computational speed up for large data sets. For small data sets, it doesn't work so well, but for large data sets, it does. And this is mainly due to parallelization. So, the subroutine for different upper bounds, you can easily parallelize. It also has an advantage of generating this uh, efficient sensitivity specificity trade off curve, which is what many practitioners are interested in. So what's next? That brings me to the future. Uh, currently, I'm working on using Ireland uh, for identifying new genotype phenotype relationships. And that's in two specific projects. Uh, one is with the Dutch ALS Foundation. So ALS is a neurodegenerative disease, which we know uh, that has a genetic basis. Um, and it's a, a university medical center here in uh, Utrecht. Uh, there has been a massive data collection, so soon we will try uh, this method on their data. And second, I'd like to look at crop data. So here in the corner, you've seen the Zero Hunger Lab. 
Um, I'm a part of the Zero Hunger Lab where we use data science to help NGOs do their work better. And one of the things that's interesting is uh, which genetic characteristics lead to crops that grow well in certain environments. And so that's also a project to be working soon. And with that, thanks to the Dutch Research Foundation for uh, funding this research and thanks to you very much uh, for your attention. All right, great. Thank you very much, uh, Marlene, for a great talk. So uh, we'll, we're ready to take uh, questions. So if you're if you're in the audience, uh, you can either unmute your mic and ask a question uh, directly, and maybe raise hands first, just so that if there's multiple people, whoever uh, raises their hand uh, first goes first. Otherwise, you can also type your questions in the chat, and I will uh, relay them to Marlene. Okay. Um, so maybe in the in the meantime, uh, I'll start with a question, Marlene. So uh, the premise is that uh, these models structured as uh, DNFs are inherently, you know, more interpretable. And indeed, you know, as a human, I can understand the mapping from input features to prediction uh, better if I read them in that form as opposed to if it's going through a complicated, say, very highly nonlinear continuous function. Um, but uh, there is this ongoing uh, debate as to, you know, the value of the value of interpretability. You know, what does it mean? What additional certainty in the mind of the user does this add, right? Would, you know, wouldn't a more, say, more accurate model, let's say you could do this task with, you know, uh, some really black box model, uh, and that that model turned out to be more accurate, wouldn't, you know, isn't that a testament that that model somehow, you know, understands or uh, uh, picks up on the mapping, on the true mapping better, for example. And then in that case, what is the, what is the added, you know, added value of the interpretability? And maybe from application perspective, there's some arguments yeah. there. Yeah, so this really depends on your application. Um, I can imagine that in some cases you're purely interested in the classification and that mm -hmm. if a new sample comes in, you just want to do the classification and that's it, and it has to be as good as possible, then indeed the interpret interpretability is not that relevant. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of cases where the interpretability is essential. So, for example, in these genome data sets, we can classify, but if we don't know why the classification happens, then we also do not know uh, how to develop new treatments because we do not know which genetic characteristics to target. So mm -hmm. here, uh, in that case, interpretability is more important than the actual accuracy, of course, provided that the accuracy is still reasonable because otherwise you still learn nothing. Um, but there, interpretability is vital. Um, also, in um, several other cases where it concerns mostly concerns uh, decisions re regarding human beings. Um, there's, for starters, the, the European law that requires when a decision is made, you should be able to explain why. Mm -hmm. And also, specifically, if you work with vulnerable groups, um, which at the Zero Hunger Lab we do a lot, uh, then mm -hmm. you definitely want to know what's going on. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, fair enough. No, the 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 latter explanation I feel like is very reasonable because it allows for some kind of accountability or transparency. But the first one, I think, about uh, using the using the predictions in order to take another subsequent decision, right? Uh, in terms of like drug uh, development, etc., is interesting because it feels to me that it relates to you know, considering prediction optimization problems together as opposed to separately, right? So sometimes people will want to build the most accurate predictive model regardless of what you will do with the actual decision. Because, the, you know, typically we think in ML as the classification being made is the final yeah. outcome, right? But usually in practice, you have to do something with that. Uh, and that's not taken into account in the training of the machine learning model itself in any way, right? Because you're just yeah. training to maximize accuracy on a training set. Exactly. Exactly. 
All right, uh, any other uh, other questions from the audience? Okay, so uh, so Sina asks in the chat, uh, so they start by saying, great talk, Marlene. Can you please remind me of the number of clauses in your solution uh, for the genome data, number of clauses? So what I used in the genome data is a maximum of 10 clauses, and uh, sometimes it uses up the 10, sometimes it doesn't, um, but it usually is quite high. So um, in, in genetics, we expect very involved uh, relationships, and that's why uh, this number should be quite high. Okay, very good. That should uh, answer it uh, very clearly. Uh, other other questions? Okay, so uh, Paul Bose asks, uh, great talk, which other use cases for DNF learning are you aware of that Ireland and other uh, methods could be useful for? Yeah. Um, that is, uh, so I do know of some studies, um, I forgot the replication, um, I don't remember, I'm sorry, I, um, if you want to know, I might com uh, come back to this. Good. Yeah, I mean, I would say, in, I don't know, in, in general, the area of interpretable uh, models is quite popular and DNFs are similar to decision decision rules, like if, else, then type models, uh, which are also special cases of decision trees. So I feel like, you know, anything that uses those kinds of models could potentially uh, use like the more uh, DNF type type model to, to make predictions. Yeah, and even the, the decision trees, uh, yes, you can sometimes reformulate them into a DNF and vice versa, um, although uh -huh. they might cause some, some complexity issues, um, but those are highly related, yes. So I actually had a question related to that for um, comparison for non-optimal models or maybe optimal decision trees or something like that. Um, have you tried heuristic approaches to see how well, that, what's the, is there a trade-off for the optimization side of things? Very, um, what do you mean? So I, I guess what I mean is um, maybe it, it, you don't take as much time to get to the optimal solution. You don't get the convergence, um, but how does the accuracy improve if you, or how how much trade-off would you take from accuracy if you don't need to spend as much time um, on learning a good model? Well, actually that also relates to, um, uh, to what extent do you want to have the global optimal solution or solution that's very close to the global optimal solution, um, which then relates to overfitting. So the closer you get to a solution that is um, giving a super high accuracy in your training data, the higher the risk of overfitting, meaning that uh, your solution might not generalize to uh, outside data. So, um, and then again, it also depends on the application. Um, so partially it's application related and partially I would say uh, your uh, validation process where you test the accuracy on, on a, a separate data set determines how far you want to go. And time-wise, it depends, of course, on how much time you're willing to investigate. If we could solve cancer, I wouldn't mind running a, a model for a few months. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, any, any further questions? Okay, if not, uh, uh, Alex, um, 